When I see the animals and the dead people in the picture, I remember that night when I went along the road to Gernika, after we left the air raid shelters. It was full of dead animals and people covered in sacks. Dead. I have always been filled with emotion to see that woman burning on the balcony with her arms outstretched. I think she could be my grandmother. Picasso's painting, Guernica. For two survivors, the town's bombing in the Spanish Civil War is a personal memory. But for nearly 50 years, it has echoed in the conscience of the world. Spain, in the 1930s, was in many ways still struggling out of the 19th century. But it found itself the arena and battlefield for ideologies of the 20th. Men and women from all over the world fought for dreams of democracy, or communism, or fascism. Those ideas were later given a bitter new meaning by the hindsight of global conflict and the Cold War. Europe in 1936. Hitler had been in power for three years. Mussolini had ruled Italy since 1922. In Russia, Stalin had begun the show trials and purges of his enemies. Democracy everywhere was on the defensive. Britain and France were fearful of a European war. Then came the news from Spain. <laughs> All is turmoil in turbulent Spain, and the cost of political anarchy is death and destruction. This unhappy country, reft into two almost equal camps, illustrates all the tragedies of civil war under modern conditions. Innocent people lose their lives, property of law-abiding citizens is wrecked, and half the combatants fight half-heartedly for one cause or the other because they're forced to take sides. Such is the fruit of anarchy, of a people divided against itself. The newsreels, as usual, had a simple explanation, anarchy. But in truth, Spain's crisis confused many an outsider. To understand it, they translated the peculiarly Spanish issues into their own. Spain became Europe's obsession. The idea of the Spanish liberalism and the Spanish work as the Spanish people um, seemed a, 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 a very passionate and pure cause um, I remember that my Oxford tutor, who was a philosophy tutor, said there was the only course in his lifetime in which there seemed um, a complete choice, absolute choice, between good as represented by the Spanish Republic and evil as represented by the Francoist forces. The convictions of Europe's left were matched by their enemies on the right. Renzo Lodoli was an Italian fascist. I thought that in Spain it was necessary to defend Christianity. It was under siege. We thought that fascism was valid as a social and political doctrine. So it was our duty to go and help those who wanted more or less the same thing as we did. Immediately, both sides sought and found gestures of support from rival sponsors abroad. In the liberal democratic world, individual sympathy for the plight of the Spanish Republic was widespread, but practical help 
from governments was to prove a different matter. The army rebels' pleas, on the other hand, were soon answered. Franco was not, at that time at least, a fascist. He was a conservative monarchist, but he was immediately assisted by European dictators who were fascists, and so he was inevitably identified with their kind of political despotism. Nevertheless, there is no evidence of any international fascist complicity in the Spanish general's original coup. On the contrary, in the summer of 1936, Hitler's thoughts were far from Spain. He was building a war machine for his own purposes, expansion in the East, and the repression of his opponents inside Germany. Hitler promised Britain that Germany wouldn't get involved in Spain. It was the first example of double talk in the Civil War, saying one thing and doing the opposite. Hitler had already sent aid. Two days after the Spanish uprising, Franco had appealed to the Fuhrer for help. After considering the consequence of a communist-influenced government controlling the Strait of Gibraltar, Hitler decided to send not the few anti-aircraft guns and fighters that Franco had asked for, but a full squadron of Junkers transport planes to airlift the Spanish Army of Africa from Morocco. One thousand five hundred of these troops were transported to Seville to begin their fighting passage to Madrid. These crack troops of the Spanish army were to play a decisive role in the war. Hitler said later that Franco should erect a monument to the Junkers 52, the aircraft that Franco had to thank for his victory. Hitler might have congratulated himself too. His help was later rewarded with a constant supply of Spanish iron ore. This gave him a great advantage in his preparations for the world war that was to follow. But in 1936, most people still thought that war could be avoided. Noi crediamo che In 1936, Mussolini had not yet become Hitler's pawn. Inquadrata in tutte le sue formazioni rivoluzionarie. Indeed, many British hoped Italy could become an ally. But Mussolini's conquest of Abyssinia had already shown that he was preparing aggressive expansion. He wanted to turn the Mediterranean into what he called Mare Nostrum, our sea, another Italian lake. There was a natural challenge at the entrance to that lake. Throughout the 30s, Mussolini had dabbled with small-scale right-wing plots to subvert Spanish democracy. He had modestly financed the leader of Spain's fascist party, José Antonio, and allowed right-wing military groups to train on Italian soil. In 1934, in a written though informal agreement, Mussolini had promised to supply arms to Spanish monarchist conspirators should they overthrow the Republic. When the time came, after the uprising, he supplied 12 bombers, the first foreign military hardware to arrive in Spain's war. While Germany and Italy supported the army rebels, Leon Blum, the French prime minister of the recently elected Popular Front government, naturally identified with the Republican government of Spain. Leon Blum feared France's isolation. Still haunted by the terrible French losses in the 1914-18 war, and already flanked by two fascist powers, France certainly did not want to be trapped in a fascist triangle. Bloom went to London to discuss plans for a collective security treaty with the British. Before he went, he ordered that arms be sent to Spain. At this meeting with Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, Spain was not officially on the agenda but Bloom discussed it anyway. On his return to Paris, he reported the conversation to Jules Mock, a member of his government. Bloom told me of his talks with Eden. 
extraordinairement extra européen. And the extraordinary non-European stance that both Eden and his colleagues were taking. Eden told Bloom we shouldn't get mixed up in it, that even if war broke out in Europe over Spain, England, who was distant from all that, would remain neutral. Therefore, since France could not count on support from England, it would be wise for her to adopt the same position as the English. And I think I can recall that Blum told me that that would be a cowardly position. In London, the British national government was worried. Conservative Prime Minister Baldwin and his ministers were concerned at all costs to avoid another world war and feared it could start in Spain. Alec Douglas Hume was then a backbencher. If uh, um, country after country began to take part in the war, then nobody could see the end of it and it could uh, end up in a big European conflict. Mussolini was careering around in the Mediterranean and making all sorts of trouble. Uh, Japan was restive, and of course, German realm was in full flood. And so we were very apprehensive about getting entangled in any other uh, situation. Britain's attitude didn't help the French Prime Minister, Leon Blum, his plan for keeping European peace by protecting Spain was also in trouble at home. His policy of unrestricted military sales had threatened to split his government and might have precipitated serious civil unrest. He therefore reversed his original decision to send arms to Spain and devised another policy to save his face. On August 2nd, the French cabinet announced that they had decided to appeal urgently to interested governments for a pact of non-intervention. The British government, supported at this stage by its Labour opposition, responded eagerly. I think France and Britain felt exactly the same on this issue. We did not want to get embroiled. And Mr. Blum, Mr. Blum um, thought of the policy of non-intervention, which wasn't a heroic policy at all. But nevertheless, it was a pragmatic policy. As France closed its borders, the Spanish Republic felt let down. Under international law, it was legally entitled to buy arms abroad. But non-intervention stopped that. No one had ever claimed heroic intention for the policy. It was a diplomatic stratagem, a framework in which everyone could safely pursue their individual ends. They would fight their battles without actually going to war. No one thought it could curtail hostilities in Spain, or even that it should. Spain provided a safety valve to siphon off the political passions of Europe at that time. The soldiers say fascist, they think about violence, about dictatura. Nowadays, when you say fascist, you think of violence or dictatorship. But at that time, we youngsters didn't know anything else. We had been brought up and educated under fascism. We were convinced that it could be a valid formula to solve social problems. Not all Italians were so convinced. Giovanni Pesci had been brought up in France. His parents had fled there to escape Mussolini's Italy. The fight for the Spanish people was also a fight against Italian fascism. This was the reason I came voluntarily to fight in Spain. La Passinaria, whose real name was Dolores Ibaruri, was a communist member of the Spanish parliament. Her rhetoric rallied worldwide support for the Republic. Era venuta la Passinaria. La Passionaria had come to Paris to ask for support, for help from the French people and the French government. La 
She finished her speech by saying, if Spain is defeated, the world will be flooded with blood. And so I, a young, very young, militant of the anti-fascist movement, said that I must also go to give my contribution. In Germany, communists have been the first target of Hitler's terror. And so when Hitler made clear his support for Franco, German communists knew which side they were on. I believe that for us German anti-fascists, it was more poignant than for anybody else. We had tangibly experienced Hitler. Thousands of German anti-fascists were already in prisons and concentration camps, and we immediately recognized the connection between Franco's intentions and those of Hitler. The politics of economic depression spilled over from the cities of Europe to a full-scale battlefield in Spain. It was mainly communists who travelled to do the fighting. Frank Deegan was an unemployed communist docker from Liverpool. I believed that if Hitler and Mussolini managed to help Franco to win, then this would be a defeat for the whole labour movement throughout the world. We thought, you know, the fascists of the world were ganging together, so a call went out uh, for volunteers to help the Republican government. The call came from Moscow. The International Committee of Communist Leaders, a Comintern, organized an international column of volunteers. Stalin himself, however, had his doubts. He was wooing Britain and France as allies against the Nazi threat and didn't want them scared off by communist intervention in Spain. He held back from sending arms. He did send advisers, ambassadors, and food. When the first Russian ship arrived in Barcelona, initial rapture gave way to disappointment when the consignment turned out to be not the guns that the Republic wanted, but canned milk. The guns only came later. Meanwhile, the Italian foreign minister Giano met Hitler at Bertesgaden in Germany. They agreed that their aid to the Spanish army rebels had to be increased, partly to counter Russian aid, and partly because Hitler had now decided he wanted to go over to the attack against the democracies. What had previously been a reflex action, a decision to supply Spain on request, became a concrete policy, a joint front against communism. A few days after Ciano and Hitler's meeting, Mussolini was heard for the first time to refer to the Rome-Berlin axis. Events in Spain had drawn Italy and Germany closer together, a step down the path towards the Second World War. I hate war! America. The world was very different in 1936. America was not the fulcrum of the world's foreign policy decisions. Still in dogged isolation from Europe's affairs, Roosevelt ignored the Spanish conflict and allowed the Texas Oil Company to supply Franco with fuel. In London, the non-intervention powers examined allegations of Italian, German and Portuguese intervention. The committee was chaired by the British. No one wanted the charges to stick, and they didn't. Von Ribbentrop, the German ambassador, later joked, a more appropriate name for the organization would have been the Intervention Committee. Nowhere was this intervention clearer than in a battle for Madrid. Until October, the skies were dominated by the rebels, reinforced by German and Italian planes. The Spanish Republican Air Force was no match until Soviet planes arrived. Just before the Soviet aid arrived, I had seen a demonstration of women marching along the Gran Via, the principal street in Madrid, shaking their fists at the German and Italian planes and shouting, no passeran, they shall not pass. Two weeks later, there was another flight of planes over Madrid. This time they flew very low and dropped no bombs. Everyone looking up from the streets suddenly saw 
that they were no longer Germans or Italians, they were Russian planes. And the cry went up that ran right through the city, Son nuestros, son nuestros, they're ours, they're ours. One day we were surprised to see some new machines in the sky, and we saw these small ones with snub noses. They flew around at a tremendous speed and shot down a nationalist plane occasionally. People began to get excited, started shouting, Long live Russia! They started to hug each other. Just 15 weeks after the start of the war, the Republic's capital, Madrid, was on the front line. The rest of the Republic lay behind. The army rebels held the territory north and west of the capital. Their land offensive began on November 7th. With only 25,000 men, the nationalists were attempting to capture a city of one million inhabitants. Franco had made ready lists of people to be arrested. Having met little resistance so far, he could not have anticipated the stubborn reaction of the Madrid people. No passaran, they shall not pass, had become the slogan of Madrid, and indeed of all Republican Spain. The government on the Lago Caballero left the capital for the safety of Valencia. So did many of the population. For those who stayed, some preparation to defend the city had already been made. General Miaka, one of the army officers who stayed loyal to the Republic, led the defense junta in charge of the overall political and military control of Madrid. Miaka and his staff officers were joined by Communist Brigade Commander Enrique Lista. The population had been prepared politically to receive the enemy with boiling water, with oil, with anything that came to hand from their balconies and roofs. The defense of Madrid was more thanks to the people of Madrid than to the militias. People joined up at once. They didn't even bother to go home. They were given some hand grenades and a rifle, and with their ordinary jacket and trousers, they got into waiting vehicles or into a tram and went off to fight. This was really striking and wonderful. It was one of the most wonderful moments of the war. Everyone in Madrid was involved. Loyal officers staffed the army. Ordinary people built defences for the city. Political parties recruited men for defence militias. But most of all, an organised army was created. However barely trained and equipped, ten new brigades of the popular army of regular soldiers, mixed with volunteers, were naturally a more effective fighting force than the old militia columns. The people's resistance was stiffened by the approach of Franco's troops and by potent propaganda. No olvides Madrid la guerra, jamás olvides que enfrente los ojos del enemigo te echan miradas de muerte. Rondan por tu cielo halcones que precipitarse quieren sobre tus rojos tejados, tus calles, tu brava gente. For two generations, the Spanish Civil War has been remembered for the international brigades. 
This fighting force of 40,000 men was a unique expression of international solidarity. There were Frenchmen, Greeks, Poles, Italians, Americans, Canadians, Irish, Czechs, Australians, Swedes, Swiss. There were 2,000 British. 500 of them died. But the war was already four months old, and Madrid under siege by the time the first organized volunteers arrived in the city to take up positions at the front. One of the first battalions was predominantly German. It was named after Ernst Tellmann, the leader of the German Communist Party who was in a Nazi concentration camp at the time. They took us straight to their hearts. They knew why we'd come. They had one slogan for us all, long live Russia. They treated us as if we were Russians, and only slowly they got to realize we were Germans. So far, Madrid had been bombed by Germans, the Condor Legion, and now suddenly, there were Germans on their side. With a background of military service, a life of resistance to persecution that bred political discipline, these German communists were an example to the Spanish. For me, seeing them brought the joy of solidarity, its warmth. They left a profound impression on Also, they showed us the things we had to learn, what discipline is, what an army is. Until then, we'd been a militia, not a regular army. Not all Republicans were so happy about the volunteers. In Catalonia, some anarchists feared their revolution was being taken over by communists. They arrested a party of international brigaders arriving from France. But in Madrid, everyone was grateful for any relief from the enemy. The international brigaders were rushed up to the front to help their Spanish allies resist the rebel army attack. There was fighting in the Casa del Campo, a park on the western edge of the city. On November 15, 1936, the rebels finally broke through Madrid's defences at a point in the university campus overlooking the park. The international brigades held the line in the philosophy faculty, but two days later the rebels attacked again and occupied part of the clinical hospital. The Tellman battalion found themselves defending one floor of the hospital from the moors on the floor below. We were on the third floor. We'd knock holes in the ceiling, and then we'd throw hand grenades down to clear them out. In this fight, there was hardly ever a real front, a front which was clearly defined. Eventually, the line stabilized, and Madrid held out. So Franco tried a new tactic. The Civil War became a testing ground for modern weapons. It was a foretaste of what was to happen a few years later in London, Hamburg, Tokyo and Leningrad. But until now, no city in history had been so sorely tested.
scenes like this on newsreels all over the world confirmed the sympathy that had attracted so many people to the Republic. Journalists like Ernest Hemingway went to report and became propagandists. The original complex Spanish causes of the war were distilled into the poetic certainties of right and wrong. Wogan Phillips, now the only communist in the British House of Lords, went to drive an ambulance. Stephen Spender, the English poet, went with him to look. We are obsessed by the feeling that this was the supreme cause of our time, a cause of poets and of writers, the cause of freedom, and that unless uh, the cause of anti-fascism was won, unless fascism was defeated, we wouldn't be able to exist as writers. Like so many British radicals, Spender at that time was a member of the Communist Party, but he represented the liberal wing of English intellectual thought. I think there was a later generation of John Cornford and Julian Bell who got killed in Spain, who felt that they wanted to submerge their uh, literature, their independence of mind as intellectuals, even their existence as intellectuals, which was, seemed subjective to them, within the objectivity of Marxism. This was the generation of Philby and Maclean. Philby was in Spain for a while, working as a Times correspondent with Franco's forces. In fact, he was spying for the Russians. Julian Bell had developed his Marxist ideas at Cambridge, in the same secret society the Apostles, which included Anthony Blunt. The threat of fascism had turned a generation of English intellectuals into communists. The brutal realities of Stalin's Soviet Union had not yet been made known. Some people, like George Orwell, however, who had gone enthusiastically to fight for the Spanish Republic, came to appreciate in Spain the danger of all pervasive totalitarian communism, he joined the anti-Stalinist party, the Poom. The persecution of the Poom by the official communists disillusioned many who thought the Republic was a democracy. Most volunteers, though, were communists, and those who weren't felt isolated. I remember going to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the front near Madrid once and meeting a young man there uh, who was an English public school boy, and he said to me, well, you know, I came to Spain and joined the international grade because I understood it to be a liberal uh, republican organisation. And what I found is that it's an ent entirely communist organisation. And then he said, I would spend the rest of my life every day walking up to that ridge that you can see a few hundred yards away, and that'll be the end of me. And he certainly was disillusioned, although he accepted this. And he did. He was killed within six weeks. But for many Spaniards, the Soviet Union's support seemed a salvation. In 1937, Teresa Pamies was a member of the Socialist Youth. I és que la Unió Soviètica ens ajudava. Era el país que venia armes al govern legítim de la República. The Soviet Union sold guns to the government of the legitimate republic. Guns came to Barcelona and their ships. It brought us this feeling of mythical togetherness, which became very solid. This comradely solidarity had a hard business edge. All the arms were paid for. Spanish gold reserves had been sent to the Soviet Union. They supplied the arms. Political influence came with them. In Madrid, morale was sustained by showing epic Soviet films like Kronstadt, celebrating the defense of the Soviet Revolution of 20 years earlier. But the Soviet influence was not revolutionary in Spanish terms. On the contrary, the Communist Party's disciplined approach to fighting the war and keeping order attracted large sections of the middle classes in the Republican zone. They had been frightened by the rival anarchist revolutionary ambition for the Republic. At the end of 1936, Stalin wrote to Largo Caballero and argued in diplomatic French that the Republic should collaborate with liberals and conservative peasants. It is necessary to prevent the enemies of Spain considering her a communist republic, he said. Stalin, remember, still needed Britain and France on his side. They were still not his certain allies against the threat of Hitler. And in Spain, 
Hitler's intentions were becoming clear. His ambassador formally recognized the Franco regime during the battle for Madrid, and now Hitler could hardly afford to let the rebels lose. Germany increased its aid and sent instructors to train nationalist officers. This gave Franco's rebels a useful but still not decisive advantage. The nationalists were holding about 60% of Spain, but they were short of troops and had stalled on a front of 1,200 miles. In spite of a dangerous bulge run Madrid, the Republic was holding its ground. The nationalist sponsors became impatient, particularly Mussolini. Without even consulting Franco, he began to send large numbers of Italian volunteers to Spain. The first battle was at Malaga. It was an easy victory. It shortened the front and raised nationalist morale. The nationalists now tried to encircle Madrid, first from the south by crossing the Jarama Valley. Republican reinforcements, including international brigaders, were rushed up to the front line. After ten days, the battle had spent itself, with heavy losses on both sides. There immediately followed another attempt to encircle Madrid, this time from the north at Guadalajara. The Italians, supremely confident after their victory at Malaga, persuaded Franco to let them fight alone. On the Republican side, the Italians from the Garibaldi Battalion of the International Brigades took up position against their fellow countrymen. This was the position of the Battaglion Garibaldi. This was the position of the Garibaldi Battalion. Headquarters was near the woods. The fascists were here, here, all in this area. Then, at about noon, we saw two cars go by. We stopped them and they said to us, but we are Italians. We answered, we're Italians too. Giovanni Pesci and his comrades had found just what they had come to Spain for, the opportunity to fight Italian fascists. They started to raise their hands, very worried, and began to cry, don't shoot us, we are Italians too. It's not our fault if Mussolini sent us here. They told us they were sending us to Abyssinia. We took them prisoner and took them to the command. When the Republican troops routed the Italian opposition, Mussolini was furious. He decided that no Italian could return home until they'd won a victory. Foreign aid on both sides poured into Spain at a faster rate than ever before. But it was not enough to clinch the war, only to prolong it. And Madrid was now a stalemate. It remained so until the end of the war, two years later. So the nationalists switched their offensive to the north. The western part of the Basque country was still Republican. It had been separated from the main Republican zone since the early days of the war. This northern region was a potentially valuable prize on account of its heavy industry and mineral wealth. It was a special region in other ways. Here, conservatives were fighting side by side with anarchists and socialists. The Basque gave the lie to Franco's claim that his campaign was a Christian crusade. The region is the most devout Catholic area in the country. Here people prayed for victory against the nationalists. Their opposition to Franco and support for the Republic came from the traditional Basque yearning for the home rule of their region, so distinctive from the rest of Spain. The Liberal Republic recognized that ambition, but the nationalists who believed in the unity of Spain were determined to crush it. The attack began on March 31st. The nationalist, General Moller, threatened to raise the region to the ground. He nearly succeeded. But first, the nationalists tried to starve the Basque into submission. The sea blockade of Republican ports posed an embarrassing problem for Britain. Several British merchant ships legally commissioned to deliver food supplies to the Republic, were stuck in the French port of Saint-Jean-de-Luz. 
The British government was reluctant to challenge Franco's navy by supplying escorts for their merchantmen. Despite outcry from the House of Commons, Eden announced that British ships would be protected only outside a three-mile limit of Bilbao. At the same time, the British were secretly negotiating with the nationalists for the output of British-owned mines in Spain. On April 19, 1937, a Captain Roberts, the master of one of those ships, the Seven Seas Spray, became anxious to leave saint jean de Luz before his cargo rotted. Captain Roberts defied the British order and set sail for Bilbao. His daughter, Fifi, was on board. So at 10 o'clock we darkened ship and pulled up anchor and uh, sailed out. Frantic flashings from the shore and a searchlight was played on us, but um, Father was doing a Nelson act, you see, and he, he just shut that eye and we sailed on. I mean, there's nothing to it. In spite of the warnings of the British government and the threats that Bilbao Harbour had been mined by the nationalists, the Seven Seas Spray arrived unscathed and sailed up Bilbao River. We were the first in and we're told there's only four days food left for the people. Everybody was cheering, hooters were going. It was rather like a ticker tape reception. Only we were coming up the river and everybody was hanging out from all their windows and waving and cheering. It was quite emotional. Captain Roberts and Fifi became the Basque people's heroes. The Seven Seas Spray had exposed the nationalist blockade as a myth, and other British merchant ships followed with food supplies. But the Basque couldn't celebrate for long. Ten miles behind the front line was the small market town of Ganika, with a population of 7,000. It was the historic centre of Basque nationalism. The tree of Ganika, the symbol of Basque freedom, stood beside the parliament building where traditionally all Spanish monarchs had sworn to uphold Basque liberties. April 26th, 1937, was market day. <laughs> The market was held where the public gardens of Guernica are now. Everything was normal, but then the planes came in the afternoon. Doña Ignatia Otomith lived in Guernica with her two daughters, Coni and Manoli. We were in the industrial zone, and over the hills opposite, I saw the planes arriving. First, just one of them. It circled twice, but we were used to seeing it do that and fly away again. But scarcely 10 or 15 minutes later, more arrived, and we were able to count them. There were eight, all in a line, black. I remember them as very black and ugly. I'll never forget the noise the bombs made. A kind of fizz. Followed by cries. Then a tremendous crash, over and over again. I can still hear the noises. And we could feel everything tremble. Smoke and heat came in. 43 aircraft, mainly German, took part in wave after wave of attacks on the small town. Carl von Canal was a squadron leader of the Condor Legion, which bombed Genica. This had no impact on me. I conducted these attacks and operations in the course of my duties as a soldier, carrying out my orders without heed for my life. At the time, we thought we were fighting a war against communism. The Condor Legion might have believed the Catholic Basque were communists, but the Spanish high command who ordered the attack knew otherwise. For both of them, Genica's cultural significance was more or less irrelevant. It was a military target. There was a small arms factory, 
a Republican soldier retreating from the nationalist attack had to pass through the town to reach the last line of defence round Bilbao. The Germans claimed their instructions were to bomb the bridge and crossroads at the edge of Guernica in order to make the road to Bilbao impassable. In three hours, 100,000 pounds of incendiary, high explosive and shrapnel bombs were dropped on the town. Little remained standing, except the arms factory and the Germans' main target, the bridge. We have, through the wind we could clearly see that the wind blew the bombs onto the fields. They missed the bridge and the houses by it. The Junkers were really commercial airplanes converted into bombers. That is, they were equipped with what we called a pot slung underneath the plane. It could be retracted during takeoff and landing and lowered during flight. And the poor observer had to climb down a tiny ladder into this contraption with his goggles and his flying helmet on. And there he had a primitive targeting device and rangefinder. The Germans' excuses don't explain why they did not use accurate Stuka dive bombers to destroy their objective, the bridge at the edge of Guernica, nor the fact that they machine gunned the fleeing population, nor the magnitude of the whole operation. I can still remember, and I was just nine years old, the force of the blast of heat in my face as I came out. All the buildings next to the factories were burning, everything on fire. The sky was red with reflections. Two days after the bombing, Fifi Roberts was taken with her father to see the devastation of the town. Forty-five years later, she returned to Ganika to revisit the scene she had photographed with her own camera. Along the road, there were streams of refugees trudging along. I don't think they had any idea where they were going, what they were going to do. They were on carts, wheelbarrows, anything that had a wheel that was being pushed and a few of their belongings on it. It's rather heartbreaking to see. And then when we got into Ganika itself, uh, there wasn't a building standing. There's rubble all over the place. Nobody to be seen except the odd soldier. I think they'd be still looking in the ruins for, for bodies. Uh, luckily, we didn't see any. But the place was an absolute shambles. 72 hours after the raid, before the reckoning of destruction could be completed, the rebel army arrived at Ganika. They immediately began a propaganda offensive as well, making show of guarding the famous Bas Tree of Liberty. They even tried to put the blame on the Bas for destroying their own town. Some people were even prepared to believe this. The nationalists' real prize lay ahead. To protect their rich industries, the Baas had built a defensive wall around Bilbao, a ring of iron but it could not protect the city from intensive bombing. With Bilbao about to fall, the Western democracies finally felt free to help. The children of Republican Spain were catalogued, given medical inspections, labeled, and transported to England, France, Belgium, America, and the Soviet Union.
Franco soon broke through Bilbao's defences and seized the region's industries and mines intact. Soon ships left Bilbao with new cargoes. Soon Franco was exporting iron ore. His clients included Germany and Britain. Both countries were to use the captured resources of the Republic for their own rearmament program. Non-intervention, either real or phony, didn't interfere much with business or prevent the world war that was to follow. Thank you.